It's interesting to look at other cultures and how they think and approach design. There's a strong design philosophy here in Denmark, and that's what I'm here to explore. Christina, what is Danish design? Well, we actually put a lot of effort into figuring that out. So we looked at products and solutions, hundreds of them from the past until today. And by that, we have identified 10 values that are unique to Danish design. Values such as human, social, simple, holistic, and user-driven. Individually, they are not unique to Danish design, but as a DNA strength, they are. So this, it looks like a lamb, but it contains AI technology and it stands on a desk at the emergency offices. And what it does, it listens in on the call and can very fast detect whether there is a cardio arrest much faster than the operator. And we know every second counts when it comes to heart attack. Yes. This looks like a pillow and it is a pillow, but it also contains music and vibrations. And it's developed and designed for people suffering from dementia or, or Alzheimer, who often gets, you know, very frustrated, angry, a lot of anxiety. So having this pillow really calm them down. It's very comforting. So it's working. It is, <laughs> it it's is very working. calming. Yeah, that's good. And last but not least is the airbird. So there's sensors within this airbird and what it does, it actually measure the indoor climate and the air pollution. It resembles the canaries that were sent into coal mines. Yeah, there to, is this link. To test the air quality. Yeah. And it has been uh, positioned in a lot of classrooms around in Denmark. And it also, it helps teachers having conversations with children on the importance of indoor climate. I recognize this. This is another Danish Design Award winner. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's the uh, soft lounge chair. Oh, I understand the name. This is hard as wood, but it is so comfortable. Exactly. Yeah. So what do we have here? So we actually have one of our chairs, and uh, one of the things we are focusing on is what we call component-based design. You actually, when you receive it, you receive it in a flat box like this, and then when you open up the box, you see these wooden pieces. Hopefully got the, the benefit of actually experiencing the nice materials that the, the chair is made out of. It's very intuitive. And the quality is excellent. All the components you can buy as spare parts. You can keep on replacing and repairing your product uh, to extend the lifetime of the product. This is the town of Bilund in Denmark. And just about everything in this town is about this. Legos! Welcome to Lego House, home of the brick. Thank you, Mike. I bought you something. I bought you my business card. Here you go. It looks like you. It is a video version of me, yes. <laughs> this is an iconic piece here. Yeah, this here is the classic Lego brick, uh, the foundation of creativity in kids all over the world. And inside Lego House, we've got literally millions of them. You want to take a look? Yes, let's go play. In Lego and in Lego House, we have a philosophy that we want to encourage learning and play through learning at an early age. And we do it through what we call learning through play. I think that there's creativity in all walks of life. Lego play, it gives a foundation to that, the way the world works, the way the world connects. Should we move on? I want to show you some more. Wait, I'm, I'm busy. I'm working on something. Okay, I'll see you later. Later. One last piece. Play something, Mike. What do you think? Legos in the 21st century. Yes, this is what we call city architect. The idea is to build a city that is great for the citizens. And they actually tell you what they might need. For example, you can see all these red guys over here. Why do you think that might be? Uh, they need more places to live. That's right. So if we add it here, for example, Suddenly they say thank you and they all move in. And this is how we build a city. That's right, it's all about creating diversity with across the city, but answering the needs of the citizens, just like real life. Camilla, you have a very specific design philosophy about city planning. We want Copenhagen to be a really active, 
livable, healthy city. Mm -hmm. And that means we have to think about design and active design in every single decision we make. Including the bike lanes. Bike lanes are huge in Copenhagen. 400 kilometers of bike lanes, half of everyone in the city uh, uses their bike to commute. Yeah. So it's an enormous part of our public life culture and how we move around in the city. This is quite a special building, isn't it, Camila? It's a very special building. We're on a playground, but we're also on top of a huge battery. And it collects all the solar energy for the entire neighborhood. Where are the solar panels? They're on top of all the roofscapes, but they're also on the sides of schools and public buildings. And furthermore, it's also a big recycling station. So you do your grocery shopping in this building, you have your energy for cooking, and then at the end of the day, you come here with your recycling uh, and dispose of your waste. In Copenhagen, we practice to put uh, people first in the design, and this was, of course, an amazing place. So this is a public space with public access? Yes. It's a, a public space, six floors uh, above the city, and, and you can really see across the entire city. And as a matter of fact, uh, this is Copenhagen's most expensive apartments. And basically up here, you almost have the same. You have an amazing view all the way to Sweden. For everyone. For everyone. The story starts here at a cafe in San Francisco, where some entrepreneurs from Southern California got their big break. So we make sustainable material alternatives for filtration, films, and resins. Okay, so let's fast forward five years. Well, that would bring us to the beginning of 2020. What do you think happened, Jenny? COVID, right? Right, COVID. COVID forced us to pivot into applying our understanding of nanofiltration into creating a better face mask for the everyday user. Very easy fit and it's light and breathable. So you make these locally in the Bay Area? Well, initially we tried, but the numbers just did not work out. And we decided that with our goal of producing sustainably uh, manufacturing in the United States, we had to go somewhere else. And so where did you go? We packed our bags for Reno, Nevada. So, wow, look at this thing. What on earth is this? Uh, so this is a bespoke machine that we were designed for the purpose of our automation and scale up. Uh, so we load our materials here and we're able to create masks using this one machine. So we use a nanofilter material as a core of our filtration. Nanofilter? What's that? So a nanofilter is essentially a much smaller uh, filtration media than the traditional filter. You can think of it as a smaller fishing net, so we can really capture some of those uh, very bad smaller particles that can enter your body. And uh, at every stage, more and more components and features are added as the material moves along. This is actually ultrasonic welding stations, and what this does is it keeps the materials integrity uh, while being able to combine the materials. I mean, welding and fabric, these are things that I would never have thought of. Oh, and here you have, of course, a box. <laughs> these are the finished masks, yeah. huh? So this goes into our QC department after it is um, uh, cleanly manufactured. Cleanly manufactured. Yeah, so normally this is a very uh, clean manufacturing environment. Obviously everything's paused for our purposes. Sure. But this goes directly from the manufacturing to our QA, QC, and packaging departments. Very cool. So Reno is a central hub of a lot of growth in terms of uh, innovation, tech, and manufacturing. So it made a lot of sense from a business perspective to build our pilot manufacturing facility here in Reno. I mean, our mission um, as a company has always been to reduce our carbon footprint while making a community impact. You know, we think about the whole life cycle of where our product comes from. From the minute that it's made all the way to where it's being shipped to, uh, we care about that a lot. And having it here in America essentially being made, we reduce the cost of, you know, the carbon emissions that's coming out from shipping overseas. And also, the best part about it is to be really hands-on in reiterating our products and making better future ones as well. You know, we are Americans and we could have taken the easy route of bringing our manufacturing overseas to be able to fulfill our scaling issue. However, we really wanted to build and contribute to building out our critical infrastructure here in the United States.